this is me working in Glasgow in um, oh man, it's a, it was a rough side of town. It was where um, Fergie's from, where Alex Ferguson's from, that side of town. <laughs> the, the gangsters there who owned all the docks had built this recording studio, amazing studio in Glasgow. And I'm using the Kemper, I took it, it's light as a feather, you know, it's absolutely just nothing in it. And if I, you're touring as DJs or, you know, people working electronic music, laptops in a bag, isn't it? Tablets in a bag. <coughs> Same thing for a guitarist, instead of putting it in the hold and it's damaged and you're bawling your eyes out, you take that, you stick it in a shoulder bag and take it on the plane with you. And it's the latest digital, uh, well, it's actually about 10 years old now. But uh, the Kemper is a device, uh, it's not just a, um, it doesn't just <coughs> emulate, it is a sampler of sorts. It's the way that plugins are created, you know, the way that when they send sine waves through, you know, um, the electronic signal path and they measure blah, 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 the responses and so forth, the impulses. That's what this is. So you, in a studio, you would set the amps and speakers up and you get you the definitive sound working, the amp, those mics, that speaker, in here, EQ'd, the rights, you know, you touch it and it's perfection. But you can't say that on the road. So that's what the Kemper was designed for. You would send from the desk into the uh, return of the effects loop, press record, and it records the damn sound. It records that sound. So you can go around going, oh, have you got a 1957 Fender, you know, Princeton or a Fender Deluxe Reverb? And you could record that amp into it. But what about the pedals? Have you got one of those old 70s big muffs? And put that on and separate it and put it into these boxes here. Whoops. Um, these are the stomp boxes, four stomp boxes, but you can assign any one to them. And then there's four uh, post boxes as well. Um, let me switch it to a patch there. There, you see the lights coming up there. So those lights uh, are the colours of coded for specific kinds of effects. Reds will be distortions probably, uh, purples modulation, um, envelope filters and blues modulations and and then greens will be r delays, stereo, because you've got two lights there. These are all stereo effects and they're mono. They've gone on the front end, like distortions, and the modulations and reverbs delay will be post, and the tone stack's in the middle. Um, but it's USB. It's USB and Ethernet. Uh, you know, you can, as opposed to use the plugins, you could just use that and connect either via the Cat5 or Cat6 it uses now, and... The or the or the USB on the back or the digital I/O, <laughs> so many ways, and keep it all in there because this has got a library of thousands of amplifiers, real amplifiers of people who actually own them, sampled in there. So it's and it's not a guitar amp per se; it's whatever you want it to be. So if I could did all bass amps, it would be a bass. It'd be a bass amp. If I did keyboards, it'd be a keyboard <laughs> instead. You know, it can sample anything into it, and then that's it stored on a USB stick. Hire one in the States, on Europe, stick a USB stick in your way. Um, that's where guitaring's at at the moment. Um, most, um, I mean, it's just reproducing sound on stage, isn't that where it's at at the moment that you, uh, people expect, and y or your standard is such that your sound on stage is professional, that everything is, all right, you're having fun, but you are actually getting deep into it if you're playing with those faders and the, and the sliders and the knobs and things and the pads. You know, it's production, live production on stage in real time. You know, hopefully, <laughs> unless you're pressing play, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, as, as a lot of celebrity DJs do. You know, um, these were my old Marshalls. Uh, they, they actually made me a signature Marshall Aziz amp, but th that actually lights up. But it was lo it looked too much like it belonged in a kebab shop, so I, I sacked it. I didn't, we didn't go, I didn't produce it. I have some silly ideas. But these are the guitars I play these days. <laughs> Even, you know, not high tech at all. There's a company called Airline, and as you can see, they're not so retro, but it's about, as you know, you know, it's about character of tone, whatever samples you use. You're looking for a certain sound and character. It's the same with guitars, you know, you're looking for a character that Queens of Stone Age are a great example of that. They look for a sound to record um, that stands out, and a lot of guitars these days and amps are samey samey. Um, I do a lot of charity work. Um, I, I, I play hospices, you know, play for, you know, um, 
children's hospices mainly terminally ill, terminally ill. So there's some of the work I do. And this was one in um, this is down south. I forgot on St Albans somewhere around there. And um, this is Thameside Arts. <laughs> there's me, the Joker at the back, as per usual. But uh, we do Christmas shows and stuff like that. Just I teach them um, some carols and stuff, uh, and then they sing them, and we play covers Saturday Night Fever or something. <laughs> And uh, whatever, it's a bit of Slade, <laughs> whatever else. And then I started working in Bristol, and uh, my friend Mim Suleiman, she's from uh, uh, Zanzibar, and we started playing in primary schools. And I'd play kinds of music, I'd do this kind of thing. I'd, I'd, I'd go to the kids, um, I'd say, Where does this music come from? What country, you know, does this come from? <laughs> And does anybody know the dance? And they'd all dance around going, oh, it's from India. And the funniest one was when I'd play something like, um, what was it? Oh, I played this. <laughs> I think I played... Uh, Where's that music from? What country is that from? They went, uh, Australia. <laughs> 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 what was the other? It was just like <laughs> I don't know. Some of them got they got this one. They, they got this one easier. So what country is this one from? I just tried to play these things for them and they'd guess where it's from. It was just all fun. But relating music to, you know, to children and because that's what everyone loves when you're a kid. You know, it's it's a point I mean, what I'm saying is that culturally you can have barriers. Some you know, you, you go home, like for me, my mum and dad was, dad especially would say, you know, from the devil, you know. <laughs> music. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the devil. You know, music a bad thing. Don't do it. And I'd be like then as I got older and I was the other one. Watching him watching these Bollywood films. They're all musicals. Shut it, son. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but it's great playing at primary schools. You really do get into... It's, it's amazing as well, because I mean, I'm playing very mixed cultural schools in Bristol and Birmingham especially, you know, 90, 95% culturally mixed, 5% um, white population. Then I play a white school, and man, you guys are flipping. What can I say? <laughs> it's just kind of, they're all jumping around laughing. And if it's a predominantly white school, it's very reserved. I don't know if it's the stiff upper lip British, you know, kind of reserved. <laughs> don't want them too shy, whatever. And these kids are just like, yay, show me the dance. you <laughs> get into it straight away. <laughs> But it's amazing to see, you know, it's actually, it does tell you something in our shyness and our awareness of ourselves and, and being outside of, I mean, that was the main thing for me, you know, because the guitar um, or music is my form of release. Because if you have a very <laughs> inhibited life, I don't know what your lives are like, I'm not judging anyone or anything, I'm just saying that, you know, you can, your parents... Man, you know, some parents are beating up on the kids, some are abusing the kids, and some are fantastic, give you everything you want, support you, some you can't even eat meat, <laughs> you know, no telly, you know, whatever. I've got friends like that, you know, grew up with that. And it's such a, again, you see, I'm talking about such a privilege to play music. Uh, and if you have that kind of restricted background, like for me, it, the music is that's why I'm full on, you know, I haven't stopped talking about it. It's because it's such a pleasure to play and to enjoy and to share. That's the main, that's why I do this, really. It's about uh, just sharing information. I ain't got no kids anyway, so it's better to just, you know, before I pop my clogs, <laughs> whatever I've got is yours or somebody else's. Any information I have, it's not a problem. Um, maybe I should let you ask a couple of questions so far. Is there anything you guys want to ask? Is there anything? It's crossed your minds as I've been talking and yadding away. Anything? It's like who influenced you to get into the 
music into music. guitar or into just music in general? Yeah, well, I mean, at home, as I was saying, my parents used to play Bollywood music, so that was an influence because I heard it every day. You know, it's like being at home, and <coughs> dad's into like, you know, Irish jigs and things like that, and you hear Danny Boy all the time, <laughs> whatever it is. It was like that at home for me, you know, it'd be Bollywood songs, and I'd be grew up with them really. So for my hand, you know, tones that I create. I can create that sound and it's not an effect, it's just my hand. Because it's second nature to me and then the rhythm hand, I don't, I'm not that bothered about, you know, some guys are just, they want to do that, but for me I'm more into the kind of, the rhythm hand, you know, as in, If I am playing rhythms, then, you know, obviously, for me, I, I had to learn how to play it, but I want to play odd time signatures like this one. Something like that to me is natural, and that does anybody know what time signature that was, or then pick up pick up on the beats, seven beat cycle that was. So it was, it was a seven. I mean, because I work with an Indian tabla player, and I just sit there and go, "How the heck do you do that?" And because they can put, fit any time signature into any space, it's like Ableton. You know, it doesn't matter what the loop or sample you just throw it in, do it in. Oh, it's in time. <laughs> You don't have to work. I mean, I grew up with old Akai samplers. I can talk to you. I bought one of the first 900s on the market. There was one before it, which um, SSR had um, when it was Spirit um, Studios in a basement. And John Brakel is a good old, old friend of mine. Um, he had a reel-to-reel -reel machine, four-track, and he got an eight-track after that. And then the studio built, and it grew into a school of sound recording. But they bought the first Akai sampler. And you used to have little slots in it that you could put these big five and a quarter drives <laughs> and floppies in. And then there was a three and a half inch floppy. And I was just talking to a young lady here before about um, SCSI. Does anybody know what SCSI is? Anyone old enough to know SCSI? So that was the main connection for your hard drives to Akai samplers on the backs of them and to MPC. You, ha you had a SCSI port on the back and that talked to um, your hard drives externally. Um, I grew up with that. So I grew up with little screens. <laughs> you know, can you imagine what you're doing on Ableton and me trying to do that on a little screen and winding through the parameter, one parameter to find it and then changing and find the other one. And that's what it was like. But it's, um, you know, that's the world in general, isn't it? You, in, you don't know any better and that is your world. So I grew up with the old school technology and then when things like the, you know, uh, SB1200 came along, the SB12 and, you know, crunchy sounds that were coming off very key instruments they, they experienced that firsthand when they were on the market and we used them because they just sounded fantastic um, but uh, I mean I've, you know that's that's equipment for you the way it grew it's changed but anyway so I'll just come back to the thing I, I use um, uh, I just want to actually I'll just finish this off so uh, these are these shows for like uh, this is in Stockport there's a school there with the special needs kids and uh, heat and uh, heat and small, I can't remember, it's around there anyway. So we play for the kids there, me and Dow. Uh, I work in prisons as well. Um, I work at um, uh, Risley, HMP Risley, and uh, I do some mentoring uh, through music. It started off through music, now it's just banter. <laughs> it's just chatting. <laughs> Nobody wants to play the guitar. Just go, uh, could you tell me, cousin uh, Norris, to uh, this? <laughs> and then I raise money or I, I, from music shops. I, I bug them, really. I go, yeah, give us some free ukuleles and give us some free strings and give us some free acoustic guitars and take them to the prisons and they get them and, and we can play some music. They have very limited facilities. Um, the reason I show you this stuff is that music and almost like social work for me, I, I can't separate them. How can you enjoy your life, <laughs> you know? 
and not and come from somewhere you know you, you know what I'm talking about you come alongside Gorton you know Salford Cheetah Mill Withenshaw Ben Shill, whatever you know you know what life's like so it's great to enjoy but how about putting something back into the community and then we move forward together you know never mind what's on in the papers never mind what's on in the universal you know international press it's at, it's at home, innit? Charity begins at home. You sort of you help out your family, you help out your friends, you help out the community, and man, your music grows at the same time for some reason. <laughs> That's how I feel. You know, there's a good balance then to your life. Uh, justification almost, I don't know why. why. But there is something anyway. There's um, some <laughs> crazy things that my guitar the board, I told you. So we had a song called Dolphins and Monkeys and Ian Brown albums, and I put. LED monkey, red monkeys and blue dolphins in my guitar, so <coughs> I did. <coughs> There's me, so I'm messing around through that see-through guitar and uh, it's on stage somewhere, somewhere. So then I've got this guitar I made, which I had made for me, which was all Swar It's covered in Swarovski crystal. It's got a thousand pound of Swarovski on the front of it and skulls and there's actually red skulls in the fretboard. <laughs> crazy guitar and the straps just the same um, some then I started doing adverts for companies and PRS the uh, reason I show you this is because PRS threw three thousand four thousand pound guitars at me and I, I said I actually like these and they're like 300 quid <laughs> and I was going you fool <laughs> you mug you could have sold that <laughs> but no it was because I, I don't want to collect I want to play and these uh, the thing about any instrument I'm sure you have little eccentric things that you use in your setups that it doesn't matter about the cost of them, it's what you can get out of it, how it makes you feel like playing, and, and that's why I was saying about these guitars, they, they made me feel like playing. 1987-ish, uh, uh, this is about the time, you know, I came out of Simply Red and I was a session musician, or I thought I was, because people were phoning me up and saying, would you come and play guitar on this? And in those days, we used racks. We didn't use pedal boards. In the 80s, it was racks. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a 20 U with another 10 at U on top. And you can see my Akai sampler in there. That's an S950 probably in there. So you know the S950? The history of the Akai samplers? Right, so you got the 3000? Yeah, yeah, so this is the one below that. It was a more affordable one. It came out before it. But the reason I show you this picture now um, is within this setup, I had the first automated mixer. Does anybody know the Yamaha DMP7? Have you ever heard of that? You have to Google it. But it's basically where my hand is on the neck. It starts there and it ends down by my knees by the light bit. Um, and that is an automated mixer made by Yamaha in, in the 80s. And the, the faders are fly, uh, flying faders. So it's just like an SSL or something. I used to set, you know, set patches and the faders just go... <laughs> and all the roads like, what? They're freaking people out. They've never seen flying faders, motorized faders before. Um, I mean, this rack sound like a bag of shite, but it was actually, it was so high tech. I had parametric EQs by TC Electronic before they sold out. Um, crazy things on there. Uh, solid state amplifiers, various guitar preamps, but <sighs> crazy things you do, you know, in search of sound and tone or, you know. And this was for some magazine. I can't remember what the magazine was. It's not made anymore, but uh, this is uh, Billy Cobham, as it says on the bird. Um, just doing a, I've had the privilege of playing with some of the greatest drummers ever and I don't know if you guys know like Mao Vishnu Orchestra or and things like that Return to Forever and Chick Career and it, this, this is the man you know and in terms of the old drummers you know there's only a few guys that people tell you about Omar Hakim and <laughs> whatever this guy Steve Gadd the they're history of drummers in that era um, I had the privilege of working with this guy I, I, don't know how it happened it just it just did I mean I work with guys like Clem Burke as well you know from Blondie uh, cool you know from the school of cool <laughs> and then obviously Mike Joyce and Rennie and from the Roses I've, I've been spoiled when it comes to drummers and then some really high-tech guys like him and uh, Marco Miniman and um, another guy um, oh, who's the, the guy in Porcupine Tree I've forgotten his name now then you start doing adverts. <laughs> I use, <laughs> you know, you're getting paid. 
and I'm using the shit, so it's not like you're going to say, well, uh, you know, it's it's false, it's real. That's the I launched the fretless guitar I showed you before, and um, and some company gave oh it was All Saints gave me that coat, so I thought I'll wear this big fur coat, <laughs> green, green fur coat. And then uh, the actually the reason, <laughs> another thing about that coat <coughs> is I, I was in London and I walked into All Saints and a guy recognised me. He was the manager of the uh, shop. And he went, Anything in the shop, free. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That's, I realised that band that I joined, and it, it was the Stone Roses, I said, this band is not like any other band that I've been in. And all day long, I wrapped my brain about, why Why did that guy just give me a free coat? <laughs> and it happened loads of times, you know? I'd be on islands in Greece, and they'd be like, Roses, and they'd say, oh, any drinks free. It happens all the time. Some bands just have that thing about them, it's music isn't just about the notes. Music is sometimes m more than that. 